I'm Dr. Robert France, Director of the Mayo Pulmonary Hypertension Clinic, and I'm pleased to be here today with my good colleague and friend, Dr. Guri Sandhu, who is Director of the Cardiac Catheterization Laboratory here at the Mayo Clinic. We're here today to visit about chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. This is a condition in which a person has had blood clots travel to the lungs, but then has failed to resolve them despite use of blood thinners for a period of several months. In this situation, the circulation to the lungs is in part obstructed so that the ability of the right side of the heart to pump blood into the lungs is impaired, resulting in elevation in pulmonary repressure, shortness of breath with exertion, and ultimately right ventricular failure. The traditional treatment for this problem has been open thrombo and arterectomy, but we find that in some patients, an evolving therapy, which is balloon pulmonary angioplasty, that is dilating the pulmonary arteries, can be useful. Dr. Sandhu, Let's go through a case. Perfect. So, Bob, basically, I think we've done quite a few cases. Let's talk about our young farmer who we saw a couple of years ago. So this was a 27-year-old gentleman. Late one fall, he developed some cough, shortness of breath, saw his local physicians. They put him on antibiotics. He struggled on for a couple of weeks. There was no resolution of his symptoms. Eventually, his local physician did a CT scan. They diagnosed him with a pulmonary embolism. And as you recall, he was placed on anticoagulation for maybe about three or four months. And then he finally came and saw you in clinic. So what did you find at that time? So essentially, this is a typical um, Midwestern farmer who works hard, had to work on his tractor, spent a long time under his tractor working on it, and then developed the shortness of breath problem. And so when he came to us, essentially, he'd been uh, short of breath and had had this, this finding of having had the prior pulmonary emboli, and in fact had a positive anticardiolipin antibody test, which is his risk factor for having yeah. pulmonary emboli, um, and had persistent shortness of breath. And so we went ahead with echocardiography, establishing the presence of pulmonary hypertension by echocardiography. Um, and he had a right heart catheterization, which showed a mean PA pressure of 45 millimeters of mercury. And so, of course, we went on to do a ventilation perfusion lung scan, and perhaps you can show what that looked like in terms of, of these findings. Yeah, so on this uh, VQ scan, as you can see on the right side, there are lots of uh, perfusion abnormalities. So the ventilation looks pretty normal on the left, but on the right side, both lungs have areas that have quite a few um, uh, bits and pieces of the lungs missing in the field. And uh, so what, what would you do next year, Bob? Well, so what we've been doing to really explore this is, is to do rotational CT angiography in the catheterization laboratory. We're really fortunate to have a cath lab set up to do uh, multimodality imaging, which can include, include rotational selective pulmonary angiography to get a really detailed look at the pulmonary vasculature in these complex settings. So let's take a look at this rotational pulmonary angiogram. So this is a picture of the right lung. We are injecting contrast in the right pulmonary artery. And as you can tell, there is a big area sort of in the mid upper portion of the right lung where there seem to be not enough blood vessels. There is something missing. So Bob, how would this fit in with chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, and what would you do next in terms of treatment? Well, we also looked at the left lung, and we had these multiple perfusion defects. And we did offer this patient surgery, since open thromboendarterectomy yeah. would potentially be a reasonable approach for this patient. But he's a young farmer. He's busy with his farming. He doesn't really want his chest opened. And, and so we discussed this possibility of an alternative approach, which is this evolving technique of balloon pulmonary angioplasty. Yeah. And uh, traditionally, uh, for chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, if you have larger clots, more central, then surgical endarterectomy is the preferred approach. That is a class one recommendation. But here, what we saw was more distal emboli, smaller vessel that sometimes the surgeons have a hard time reaching. And so then we went to our next 
um, plan B. Exactly. And so what we do now is we take selective pulmonary angiographic images in order to guide the balloon procedure. Um, Gurry, as you think about this procedure, if you were to talk to a young interventional cardiologist about this and how this kind of procedure compares to putting in a, a, a coronary stent or something, what would you say about the complexity and experience that it takes to do this procedure safely? Yes, so in terms of complexity, this is definitely more challenging than doing a coronary angiogram. As a cardiologist, we are trained to look at three vessels and we pretty much know where their branches go and it's mostly a two-dimensional image. But with pulmonary arteries, every single branch is going off in 360 degree directions. It's hard to tell anterior from posterior, sometimes superior from inferior, depending on your angle. And plus, with many of these branches, if you're not careful, you don't know where your wire is traversing distally. You can easily perforate, and now you're in open lung uh, space. And someone with a high mean PA pressure is very likely to bleed out. So these are difficult procedures, but need to be done extremely carefully. Exactly. And even identifying the lesions is a little bit more difficult because it's not always a typical narrowing the way we might see in a coronary artery, but maybe a filling defect or just impaired distal perfusion where we just don't see the capillary bed well. And so we'll show you this picture of the before and after of this particular segment that is one of the segments that, that we dilated. And you can see that there's very poor capillary filling and really no pulmonary venous return. So what we would consider the equivalent of TIMIG3 flow in the coronaries is just not there in terms of brisk pulmonary venous return. So a very careful traversing of this with a wire and sequential balloon inter inflations, now you can see this beautiful blush in the periphery of the lung, and you can see the pulmonary vein returning uh, quite nicely. So this would be a hallmark of a very good result with a balloon pulmonary angioplasty procedure. Yeah, for pulmonary arteries, basically the hallmark of success that we look for is venous return. So as you can see in the beginning, we had nice arterial flow all the way out to the periphery of the lung, but there was virtually no venous return. So that was not good blood flow. Now, after doing balloon angioplasty, we suddenly see marked vascular blush distally. We see really uh, brisk venous return. So this is a successful result. It really looks terrific. And so these are stage procedures where in order to reduce the risk of reperfusion pulmonary edema and limit radiation and contrast load, we would potentially do one or two segments or three depending on size of them and other parameters and then give the patient a break for a few days or even a month, depending on their schedule, and then bring them back for additional work. Yeah, so Bob, do you wanna uh, talk about why we do not treat more than two or three segments at a given time? The basic rationale for this has to do with this, this problem of being at risk for reperfusion edema, where this is like breaking open the floodgates. You can see you've suddenly got this wonderful venous return and capillary blush, but that is a, a vascular territory that's not really used to that kind of brisk flow. And so it may get wet. You, on chest x-rays, sometimes you will see some, some edema in that area subsequently at 24 hours. And if you do too many segments, you can really have a serious problem with hypoxemia, which could be, in fact, life-threatening. Yeah. Yeah, so this patient came back uh, about four times. And then you want to talk about what we found after four different settings? You know, so we have some of the hemodynamics shown for you here on this slide. And essentially, after four sessions over seven months, which had a little bit to do with the, the cycle of farming and when this gentleman could come back and forth, he's had a very nice result where the mean PA pressure is down to 30 and the pulmonary vascular resistance is two and a half wood units and very, a really terrific cardiac output and really full resolution of symptoms and back to, to farming full time with no medical therapy other than long-term anticoagulation. Yeah. So this is a really gratifying result and so this is the kind of patient for whom we're considering balloon pulmonary angioplasty and are always available to talk or think about patients who might be considered for referral for this procedure. Yeah, and there are clearly some patients who are not candidates for this procedure. Those would basically be patients with either central emboli that can be extracted surgically, so they might have better results with that. There are others which we have uh, noted where they have long-standing pulmonary hypertension, more of small vessel disease, distal uh, lesions that we can't reach with balloons. Any other thoughts, Bob? 
I think those are the main ones. And if the renal function is quite poor, especially in a diabetic, we'd be, be uh, leery about doing this procedure because the contrast loads can be significant. Yep. Although by carefully staging the procedures, we can limit that to some extent. Gurry, thanks so much for being here with me today to talk about this evolving field of balloon pulmonary angioplasty and treatment options for chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. Thank you, Bob. This is wonderful. And thank you for your attention today. We're always happy to chat with you or accept referrals for patients who may be candidates for therapies for chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. When you see a patient who's short of breath, think it could be pulmonary emboli, either acute or chronic.